Hi, I'm Joseph Patrick Daniels, and this video is part of my guided course, Acrylic Painting from Beginner to Master. You can find the complete course by visiting my website, www.painters-academy.com. In this exercise, I'm going to introduce you to a new kind of color palette that's going to change the way you see colors forever. And in this lesson, you're going to begin learning about color theory. So, before we begin this lesson, download the files Riley Color Palette, 5 Value Blue Scale, 5 Value Orange Scale, and the Color Wheel from the course curriculum and print them all out. Let me explain how this works by comparing it to something you're all familiar with, the Color Wheel. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you to the vague, unexplained techniques of the Color Wheel. In this lesson, I'm going to give you very specific instructions, right down to the percentage, on how to mix every color imaginable using the least amount of paint possible. I'll explain how it works for those of you who didn't pay attention during art class in high school. These are all of the colors in the rainbow. To make them lighter, simply add white. Sounds simple enough, but here's the problem. Take this green, for example. Is this the darkest value of green? Not even close. So you add white to get lighter and lighter. But have you ever been to an art store and seen how many different kinds of green paint there are? So which one should I buy to mix regular green? Windsor green? Prussian green? Permanent green light? Sap green? Cadmium green? Viridian? You get the idea. Those are all very different colors. Some of them have blue in them. Some are made with yellow undertones. Some are cool and some are warm. And to both darken or mute a color, you're supposed to mix some of the opposite color into it. But when I mix red and green, I get mud. Sometimes it was slightly darker mud, but I didn't have much control over the outcome. To control color, you first need to be able to mix the brightest, purest possible version of it from darkest to lightest. Then you need to be able to control its brightness. Take this red scale for example. This is the brightest or most chromatic possible example of each value of the color red from dark to light. Chroma is a color's brightness, not to be confused with lightness or darkness. So, in order to control a color's chroma, you need to be able to mute it. Value and chroma are the two aspects of color that you need to learn to systematically control. And for that, I have a chart. It's easier than it looks, let me explain. You already know how to mix your grayscale, so the hard part's over. The rest of the color scales work the same way. The chart tells you exactly which colors to use. Take red-purple, for example. You would mix white into alizarin crimson to lighten it all the way down from darkest to lightest. Just like the grayscale, but with color. Each row on the color chart is a color from the color wheel, but now you'll know exactly which tube of paint you'll need to mix the brightest possible version of it from darkest to lightest. So this chart covers the full range of each color's value, and once you know how to mix all the colors in full chroma, the next problem you need to solve is how to mute them without letting them get muddy. And that's where your grayscale comes back into the equation. I'll explain how it works. Take the red scale, for example. Let's say I wanted to mute ninth value. I would mix it with ninth value from the grayscale. That way, the value would stay the same, but it would get grayer or more muted the more ninth value gray I added. So the more gray you add, the more muted it gets, but it can never get muddy. Here's eighth value from brightest to muted. And third value? And it works the same with every color scale. Just mix the adjacent gray with the same number value on the color scale and you'll be able to mute it as much as you want. And it works between color scales as well. So for example, if you wanted a color in between red and orange, you could mix them together, creating any color possible to its finest degree. But I'll expand more on how to do that in the coming lessons. The system works like a grid, and that's true control over color. Now, I can't take credit as the creator of this chart. It was invented by the artist I told you about earlier in the course named Frank Riley back in the 1960s. Frank Riley was a painter and illustrator, but where he truly shined was as a teacher. His techniques and palette were so brilliantly simplified and organized that he went on to found a school to teach them, and this is his color system. 
but he used it for oil painting. That's why it's 10 values. Of course, oils take much longer to dry than acrylics. Weeks, sometimes months. So I adapted it to 5 value scales for acrylic painting. That's why you'll find 10 value to 5 value conversion charts in each lecture as we progress in the course. And don't worry if that sounds confusing. I'm going to walk you through how to mix each one as it's needed just like I did for the grayscale. I included the full chart for a number of reasons, most of all because I want to make sure you have all 10 values in case you need them for future projects. The next painting we're going to do is the orange balloon. So you're probably wondering why I had you download a blue chart as well as the orange chart. Since we're beginning to work with color in this lesson, I want to start talking about basic color theory. That's where the blue chart comes in, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going to start this painting the same way you should start every painting, with a grayscale underpainting. We won't be adding color until the second coat. So I'll walk you through mixing each value of the orange scale once we're finished painting the first glaze. That way, it doesn't start drying while you work. And again, don't worry that my balloon is redder than yours. The one I use when we start painting color will look like this. Next, let's talk about why I asked you to print out a blue scale for this exercise. In this lesson, I want to introduce you to color theory. But, like everything else in this course, I'm going to start with the basics and build on them as we progress. So first, I want to simplify this concept by explaining its most basic principles. Starting by showing you how to identify warm and cool colors and complementary colors. Then, I'm going to show you how to put them all into a real-life application in this painting. So things are about to get interesting. Let's circle back to the color wheel. In its most elemental breakdown, you can divide it into two halves. On one half is the cool colors, and on the other half you have your warm colors. Simple enough. The color directly across from any color on the scale is its complementary color. So, for example, yellow-red's complementary color is blue-green, and orange's complement is blue. Using only opposite colors in a painting is the most basic color scheme possible, and it's appropriately called a complementary color scheme. The reason they're called complementary colors is because they look good next to each other, if one is muted. But if they're both at full chroma and touching, the colors will vibrate and generally not look good. By the way, see that dark line where the red and green meet? That's an optical illusion. There is no dark line there. That's the vibration of the two colors touching. We're going to delve further into much more complex color theory as the course progresses, but the trick I use when I'm designing the color compositions of my paintings is, I look to nature to help me come up with beautiful color combinations. Because as human beings, our brains are hardwired to prefer nature and its color configurations. For example, I designed this entire course around the color combinations of a sunset. Let me explain what I mean. Take the balloon you're about to paint, for example. The original picture you're seeing me use as a reference isn't necessarily interesting or dynamic, but look at the finished painting. I've made subtle changes to the colors based on the color pattern from the sunset I just showed you that have made it look much more interesting. Allow me to break down what's happening in that sunset that's so pleasing to our eyes. These are the colors present in this image. And here's your color wheel. Compare the color bar to the color wheel. There are two things you should notice about these colors. First, you should notice that every color in the image fits into one of these three color scales. Blue, yellow, red, or yellow. That's called a triadic color scheme. So, two warm colors and a complementary cool color. And they form a triangle on the color wheel. The second thing you should notice is that most of these colors are muted. Only a few of them are at full chroma. So the grayscale is very present in this image. The moral of the story is you can use any number of color trifectas. The trick to this color scheme is to let one color be dominant. In this case, it's yellow, which means you would have to mute most of the colors. And that's how you would manage what the highest chroma or most vibrant colors would be. And once you start looking, you'll find that nature often offers similar color combinations in the most basic pleasures. Take this pile of random seashells. It's the exact same color scheme as the sunset. 
So, for example, the sky on a clear day is about third value on the five value scale. It's blue at its highest chroma. And any clouds you see during midday are white or gray. Which color theory conforms to? One color, blue, is dominant and paired with a muted color, or absence of color, the white and gray of clouds. But as the sun sets, another color is introduced, and the blues in the image both get darker and more muted as its complementary color becomes more vibrant. That's how perfectly balanced and calculated nature is. So keeping that in mind, as you design a painting, if you have a bright, vibrant color, to balance a piece of art, it helps to have its complement present, both muted and darker. So that's how a complementary color scheme works. Next, there's the easiest color scheme to manage, a monochromatic scheme, which of course is choosing any one color and doing a painting relying only on values, like we did with the eggs. Then there's an analogous color scheme, which is three colors side by side on the color wheel. A simple analogous color scheme can include any three adjacent hues of a 12 hue color wheel. It's generally soothing and easy to manage. For example, blue and violet are analogous colors. Then there's the tetradic color scheme, which is four colors that are evenly spaced on the color wheel. Tetradic color schemes are bold and work best if you let one color be dominant and use the others as accents. So, to review, so far we've covered the monochromatic, complementary, triadic, analogous, and tetradic color schemes. These five color schemes are far from the only ones, and of course there are a number of variations of each one. Don't worry, we're just getting started. I'll expand on this concept more as the course progresses. But rest assured, by the time you've completed this course, you will know how to easily manage a palette this complex. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great tips on traditional drawing and painting techniques. And visit my online art school, the Beginner to Master Art Academy, if you'd like to preview the full course, as well as oil and acrylic painting courses for both beginners and experienced artists. Start your journey today.